Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Parsha Shir. And we're holding over here tonight in Parsha's Vayakil. And I want to speak about a famous question that is asked in the Mefarshim that is really a fascinating insight into even our own lives, not just the lives of Kali Yisrael that was in the Midbar. We know that the Jewish people came out of Mitzrayim. They were accustomed to building bricks made out of mortar and stone and, and straw. They were not very skilled in the details of craftsmanship. So Claudius was in a situation where they were coming out of Mitzrayim and they were commanded to build a Mishkan to build the tabernacle. And the Mishkan itself was from the most detailed and precision based uh, buildings that there ever was in the history of the world. There was a lot of detail that had to go into there, a lot of ornate tapestries and weaving, and that the melting of golds and coppers and different materials that were all put together. And they had to create what was going to be the most beautiful edifice that you could possibly imagine. So how is it possible that a slave nation that's coming out of Mitzrayim, that has no skills, they have no idea at all how to be able to design and to make and to build and to create and to weave into all the different things they had to do. How were they able to make a Mishkan that would end up harnessing all of the powers of the physical world in order to create a venue that would allow the Shekhinah to come and dwell inside? It's one of the wonders, it's one of the pleas, one of the wonders of the, the Jewish survival and the Jewish travels in the Midbar. And it's something that the Mefarsh and the commentators take quite seriously. So the, the Nitziv writes in the Parsha that the answer is in the words that describe the people that were coming to build the Mishkan. Because if you look already at last week's Parsha, this is already going back to Parsha's Kisisa, and it begins speaking about the building of the Mishkan over there. The Pasuk says, give to Betzalel, uh, someone else, uh, 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 to come and build together with him. And in the heart of every wise-hearted individual, I will put chachma, I'll put wisdom into their heart. And they will be able to perform and to make everything that I can make. So the Pasuk of here says, in the heart of every single wise-hearted individual, says HaKadosh Baruch Nesati Chachma, I'll put Chachma, I'll put wisdom. Isn't the person already wise-hearted? It says, in the heart of every person that's wise-hearted, I'll give them Chachma, I'll give them wisdom. Well, I already am a Chacham Leiv, I already am a wise-hearted person. Why does HaKadosh Baruch have to add Chachma wisdom into the heart of someone that is already a chacham, that is already wise. If the person doesn't know anything, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu say, I have to make a miracle over here. He's an ignorant when it comes to building. This is before there were Israelis. So there is no way for them to know how to build a mishkan. And therefore, says the Torah, so then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I have to teach them how to build a mishkan. But the Pasuk says, Who believes, kol chacham leiv, in the heart of every wise-hearted individual, Nasati Chachma says, I will place wisdom. What wisdom are you placing in there? So the Nitziv on these words writes that the truth of the matter is, is that they might have had Chachma, they might have had wisdom, but they did not have the, um, they did not have the, the intelligence or the wisdom or the understanding of what they were supposed to do to build the Mishkan. So on that, HaKadosh Baruch had to infuse inside of their hearts Chachma, more wisdom, more understanding, more details, in order they should be able to build the Mishkan. But how can HaKadosh Baruch give that to someone who doesn't have the, the, the skill set? Says the Nitzit, how did the Jewish people know that they would be able to build the Mishkan even though they have no idea exactly how to do it? They didn't go to school. They didn't train. They don't have any experience. They were not apprenticing anybody. 
bitachon. In the merit of the bitachon, the trust that they had, sheichachem b'melachazu, that Hakadosh Baruch Hu would wise them in this melach in this work that they had to do. Afal gav shelo ilamda, even though they never learned it before. They didn't have any skill in this at all. Nevertheless, says the Nitziv, since they trusted in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that if they have a mission that they have to achieve and complete, and they have a mishkan that they have to build, so then in the schus of that pitachin, which the Torah is calling Chacham Leif, in the schus of that pitachin, HaKadosh Baruch Hu would open up their minds open up their hearts to be able to understand how to do something that was really an impossible thing for them to do and they would accomplish and they would achieve this goal that they wanted to meet. And that follows with what he says in this week's parsha: The chol ish chacham leif in the heart of in, to every man chacham leif who is wise hearted. And then the verse goes and, and, uh, and that's the passage. And then in Siv writes over here the same idea. It was impossible for them to learn everything that Moshe Ben was telling them. Moshe was giving, and this is also another one of the questions. The Torah itself never ever wastes a drop of ink. Everything in the Torah is Kodesh HaKadosh and is the holiest of holies. I was traveling on a plane few planes last week, and I got on a plane from New York to Cincinnati. It was one of these very small planes, and it was half full. And as people are beginning to walk on towards the end of the end of the boarding, and they were walking towards the back, the store, they said, whoa, 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 come back, come back, come back. You need to sit over here, you need to sit over here. We have to make sure we distribute the weight the right way on this plane. That's very, makes you feel very <laughs> confident when the plane is about to take off, that you're distributing the weight to make sure that it doesn't tip over one way. So when I first sat on the plane, I was sitting next to a very nice old Christian lady, and she begins asking me questions. Are you a rabbi? Or she said, are you a teacher or are you a student? I said, I am a teacher, but I will always be a student. She said, oh, I like that. And then she pulls out a book, and the book is called Making Sense Out of the Old Testament. And she starts <laughs> giggling. She thought it was very cute that she's sitting next to a rabbi, and she has a book that's talking all about making sense out of the Old Testament. So in the end, once that we the plane took off, so the old lady and I didn't have to sit next to each other because the plane was pretty steady, and I was able to move to the seat behind her. Where I, she had a road to herself, I had a road to myself. But I'm peeking through the seats to see her reading her book on making sense out of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, by the way, is what we call the Chumash. So I'm peeking through the seats, and the name of the chapter that she's reading is Explaining the Old Testament in 15 Minutes. And I thought to myself, in last week's Pasha, Moshe Menu goes up to the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He doesn't eat, he doesn't drink. Not once, but twice. Moshe Menu was the wisest of all the men, the greatest Talmud Chacham, the biggest tzaddik of the generation. He's speaking pun him out, pun him mouth, face to face with the Rebbein Nishayim. And Moshe had to go up to the mountain twice. 40 days in a row, no eating, no drinking, no sleeping, just learning, 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 learning. But apparently this woman knows how to learn the Chumash in 15 minutes or less. So it's obvious that you cannot explain the Torah in 15 minutes. And it's obvious that the Torah itself, every single ice, every single letter that is there, or like the Gemara tells us, Rabbi Akiva, he was dashing on Kol Tag with Tag, every little sign every little crown that's on top of the top of the letters would be keep with darshan he would expound so if that's the case that our Torah HaKadosh is such a holy book and is filled with so much knowledge wisdom chachma bina understanding of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so we come to the building of the Mishnah 
And the Mishkan has not one parsha, not, not, not one parsha, not two parshas. There's one parsha previously about the building of the Mishkan. There's another parsha about the clothing of the Kohanim. And then the Torah in Vayakov Bakude repeats everything all over again. Exactly detail for detail. So much so that Rashi and Parshas Vayakov is almost silent. He almost has nothing to say. Because he said it already earlier on, Parshas Truma, when we're speaking about the erect in the Mishkan. So why does the Torah, which is the wisdom of HaKadosh Baruch which is careful with every single letter that it writes, why does the Torah have four parshiyos, two of them which are a repetition of the previous two, which go through all of the details of the building of the Mishkan and don't really even change a single word, a single command, a single instruction that is there. And on this, the Torah has to tell us that Klal Yisrael had no idea to build the Mishkan at all. They're coming out of slave labor. They have no idea what to do. They didn't have a chance to be able to learn everything that Moshe Benu did. But with their wisdom, they were mechavin. They intended. They intended that everything should turn out exactly the way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants it to be. Linitziv is telling us a very powerful idea over here. And it's the same way that he's saying it earlier. And that is that if you want to do the Ratzon of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you want to succeed in doing HaKadosh Baruch Hu's will, you have a desire to keep the mitzvahs, you have a desire to become a better Jew, you have a desire to, like Shlomo Melech says, Chachmas Noshim Bansa Besa, the wisdom of the woman who builds the house. You want to build a beautiful Bayez Neman be Yisrael. But you know that you don't have all of the tools and you don't have all of the wisdom and you don't have all the experience behind you to do what it is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you to do. If you are Beiteach, if you trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you deeply want that everything should turn out in the right way that Hashem wants, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will make a nace with you he will give you the wisdom and the insight and the understanding. He'll even turn you into a craftsman when you are nothing more than a bricklayer. And you'll be able to build the most beautiful mishkan that there is in the world. And he concludes his comments and he says, mishkan. This is the way that it was in the building of the mishkan. Every person was able to choose the activity that they wanted to be involved in in the building, even though they didn't learn it at all. However, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them Hatzlacha. He gave them success according to the way in which they lifted up their hearts to come and perform this great task, the mitzvah that was in front of them. Says the Nitziv, and it's a fascinating idea, and that is, he just, just to say that he goes, and the Nitziv is late, Haisim atonam Hashem, and it's all a gift from HaKadosh Baruch If you will lift up your heart, and you want to accomplish, and you want to achieve, and you want to do something that you have no idea what you're doing, but you know it's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you the intelligence, the ability, the wherewithal, the intuition to accomplish something that for somebody else will be impossible. Even though their fingers were never skilled in this work, the calls in, the see his lay high samatana Hashem. That's what he's saying. Meaning, even though that Klaus had no experience at all, but they wanted, Klaus Baruch gave them a gift. Now, this is not only in the building of the Mishkan, this is in every single area in life. There are many, many things that we do not know, there are many aspects 
of Avedis Hashem that we are in the dark of. We're not quite sure how in the world are we going to accomplish and do this. How many mitzvahs are there that are out there in the world that we have absolutely no real yidiyah, no knowledge, no wisdom, we didn't learn about it, we don't understand it. And yet HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you want, if you have a desire, if you trust that if you will set forth to accomplish and to do, I'll show you the way, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, as a gift, I'm going to give you that thing that you would like. How can we explain? Today, maybe we don't see it as much as we did in previous years. How can you explain the, the revolution of the Balei Tshuva, which started in the 1970s and had a good run probably till somewhere around the 2000s? How could you explain? A person knows nothing about Yiddishkeit, nothing. They don't know an Aleph from a base. They don't know a Shabbos from a Saturday. They don't know matzah from a Ritz cracker. They don't know anything. And suddenly the guy gets hooked or the woman gets hooked that this is the emiss, this is the truth. And they leave their life behind and they enroll themselves into an Eshetoira, to a Or Sameach, to a Machon Shlom or something of that nature. And they begin learning Torah for the very first time in their life. The 20 years old, the 25 years old, the 30 years old, they have no background. The little kids in the streets of Yushalayim at three years old knew more about Torah than this 30 year old doctor who never learned one mission or one page of Gemara in his life. And how can you explain that this person suddenly begins to immerse himself in the studies, immerse himself in the life going to people's homes, seeing the beauty of Yiddishkeit. And in one year, two years down the road, the person has a transformation. And they look like a different person. They talk like a different person. They act like a different person. Their mind works like a different person. They begin thinking like a Froom Jew, like someone whose hashkaf, his outlook on life is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants me. How do you learn so much in such a short amount of time? I was once walking with a fellow, he was a Baal Shuva. He was, he was, became from later on in his life. And when he became religious, he had no chance to go to yeshiva. So if you're about Shuv and you can't go learning yeshiva, it's, it's not easy. There's a lot that you have to try to learn on your own. And we used to walk to shul together on Shabbos morning in Baltimore. And in order to get to the shul that we had to walk to, there was a great shortcut that you could take. You could take a shortcut through this apartment complex through the parking lot, take it right through, you come out the other side and you're there, you're in the shul already. But if you didn't take the shortcut, you had to walk all the way around the street. It would take an extra 10 minutes before you'd get to the shul. It's cold in Baltimore in the winter. It's a brisk walk. And if you could save yourself some time, it's a wonderful thing to do. So we're walking on the way to shul. And uh, his name was, his name was Stuart. And we're walking, and I said, hey, start, look, you know, if we go down here, there's a great shortcut. We'll save a lot of time getting the shul. We'll take, we'll take 10 minutes off the walk. So I start walking, he stops. I said, start, come, let's go. So he looks at me and he says, if you take shortcuts over here on your walk to shul, you're going to take shortcuts in shul also. You take a shortcut here, you'll find a shortcut in your davening. Take a shortcut over here, you'll find a shortcut in your learning. He says, don't take shortcuts in life. I said, okay, but let's save some time over here on the walk to shul and let's take it. He said, I'm not going to take the shortcut. Now, this reminded me of a story that is said over about the altar of Helm, I believe, who lived 200 years before 150 years before that, who was a massive, massive Talmud Chochem, a Torah scholar and a tzaddik Yisraelim from the greatest tzaddikim of the generation. And there was a very similar story that happened with him. And the story was that there was once, the, in the Talmud Torah of Kelm, in the yeshiva of Kelm, there was a fence that was around it. And two Bachrim came once to go into the yeshiva, and the gate was locked. 
So they were dedicated to their learning. They didn't want to miss out. So they begin climbing the fence in order they should be able to get over the fence and go into the building and learn. And right at the time that they're climbing up, up and over to the fence, the altar of Kel comes walking by and he says, Oh, what are you doing? And so they were very proud. This is Rebbe. The fence is locked. The gate is locked. We can't get in. So we want so badly to learn. So we're climbing over the fence. The end of the yeshiva. So the altar of Kel chided them and he said, if you will climb fences over here, you will climb fences elsewhere in Torah as well. And he told them, don't climb the fence. All the Dirabban and all the rabbinical laws are all the fences, the, the Gedarim of Torah and the mitzvahs. And if you will climb over this fence, you'll climb over Dirabban and also you'll find the reason why you can't keep that particular law. So here's a guy, Stuart, in Baltimore, Maryland, in whatever the year was, 2000 and something, about Shuva. He never learned in yeshiva before. He had Baruch Hashem connection to a very wonderful Rebbe. But his learning was very limited. And yet in his mind, he came up with the same exact idea as the altar of Kelm. How do you explain that? The altar of Kelm was the biggest scientific of the generation. He had all the Torah on his fingertips. He had every single Musa Sefer on his fingertips. He had all the Mephorshim on his fingertips and in his heart and his soul. Because he's a Chacham Leib. If you have in your heart that you want to do the ruts and you want to do the will of Hashem, you have in your heart, HaKadosh Baruch I want to serve you. I have no idea what I'm doing, but you, HaKadosh Baruch you're going to help me. Hashem will make a nice, he'll make a miracle. And as a matana, as a gift, HaKadosh Baruch is going to give you that which you are asking for. The more that you want to do the will of Hashem, and you acknowledge and you recognize, I'm not sure at all what I'm doing, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will take care of you and he will give you a big matan, a big gift, and he'll allow you to do what you were mechav and what you set out to accomplish. A woman also, Balas Chuba, told me that when she became religious, it was after she and her children, after her husband and her were married, and after the children were born, she becomes religious. She starts keeping Shabbos, starts keeping Kashras, starts keeping Yom Tiv, starts keeping all the holidays. The house is becoming a religious house, but they already have little kids. And she said, I have no idea how to, relate, how to raise a religious child. What am I supposed to do? I have no idea. I never had Shabbos at my table. I never knew what it means to tell them not to turn off the lights. I don't know what it means to make a brach. I don't know anything. How am I going to raise a child to be religious if I wanted them to be religious, if I myself am trying to become religious myself? So this was her prayer to our Kodesh Baruch, and I imagine she must have adopted this prayer hundreds, if not thousands of times. And she says, our Kodesh Baruch, I became religious for you because I recognized the Torah is the truth, and this is the way that the Jews should live their life. She said, you gave me children already before I became religious. I have no idea how to, how to raise a religious child. So I ask you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you raise my children for me. And this was her tefillah. And she davened, and she cried. When she lit the candles Friday night, when she lit the candles on Yom Tiv, when she had free time with her tehillim, when nobody was watching, she cried and cried and cried. I'm doing all of this for you. I want to be religious. I want my children to be religious. I don't know how to do it. You raise my kids. And this woman, Bumi Ayinhara, has a family of Tamir Chachamim, of the ones, the daughters are married to Tamir Chachamim, and they're all somewhere in the world, wherever all these children are, on Marvitz Torah, they're spreading Torah to Chal Yisrael. And they have children and grandchildren and beautiful mishpacha, oiskim by Torah mitzvahs that are serving Hakadosh Baruch in the world of Torah mitzvahs. How? Because that's exactly what the Ritziv is telling us. If you want something for Hashem, even if you don't know how to do it, Hakadosh Baruch looks at the chachmalei, 
the wisdom in your heart. He looks at the fact that you trust in him, that he's going to help you accomplish. Don't worry. HaKadosh Baruch will take care of it. And it's going to end up, it's going to happen. Last, one of the reasons I was traveling last week is because I was by the Hasana of, of Yossi Hecht and Sasha Franco. Those of you that remember, see, this is a card from the Hasana. Those of you that remember, Yossi Hecht came here, he was a young man in a wheelchair who was 21 years old, I believe, when he was diagnosed with spinal cancer. They removed the tumor from his back once. And after that, he had certain issues, but he was still able to walk. But after the second and the third surgeries that he had, so he, wo he woke up in the hospital to the very unfortunate news where they told him, your legs are not working anymore. You're not able to walk. So what do you do? You go from being a person who is the life of the party, a person who is the biggest macha, the biggest big man on campus in the yeshiva, He's the one running to every single house and every single wedding and doing shtick and doing all different things, juggling fire and the like. He's the one who davens and leads the beautiful davening on Shabbos. He's the one who lays the Torah. He's the one who's always there for all of his friends. So what do you do? How are you going to survive? So he did the same thing. I don't know what you want from me. But I know that you're keeping me alive and you want me in this world and you want me to do something with my life then you've got to give me the kayak, you've got to give me the strength to be able to overcome and become the best yasa that I can become in my life. And so this boy went on to create an organization called Asher to the Yatsar, which is a whole organization of giving chizuk to people in the brach of Asher Yatsar after a person uses the restroom and other blessings that a person makes and accepting upon themselves the difficulties and the hardships of life, having real amun and real bitachim. And he therapized himself, if that's such a word. He worked through himself with all of this that he was trying to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he brought himself to a place where he's a mali simcha person. He's full of joy and full of happiness, and he exudes life. But he's 25 years old, and he wants to get married. He's a young man in a wheelchair. So it's not going to be such an easy shit off. One day, there's a girl from our community, Sasha Frankel. She's living in New York for several years. She sees one of his videos. She sees his determination. She sees his inspiration. She sees his positivity. And she says to herself, that's the man that I want to marry. And she calls his Rebbe, and she asks the Rebbe, make the shit off. And the rest is history. Last Thursday night, I was by the Hasana. A small wedding of about seven or eight hundred people. And each one was leaping out of their skin with joy for this young Hassan and Kala. And this boy Yossi was in his wheelchair. You know, one of the songs that we sing is Kate's Miratim Lifne Akala. How should a person dance in front of the bride? And they usually bring the bride out at that time. She sits in the chair and everybody starts dancing for the bride and the groom. At one point, the groom is supposed to dance for the kala. So Ketzal Merak and Lidna Kala, how is the groom in the wheelchair going to dance in front of his kala? He'll dance in the wheelchair. And he has some good moves in that wheelchair, I'm telling you. Some wheelies and some back stuff like this, and he's dancing all around. And then he goes like this. And somebody walks out with three uh, sticks of, that are flaming fire. And the next thing you know, he's jumping fire in front of his collar just like this. And the whole place is mesmerized. And then they bring in some boys that are also wheelchairs, some worse than the others. And there's a wheelchair dance. Everybody's dancing together. And all the rebellion that come, they are smiling like I've never seen smiles dancing and dancing. They couldn't get out of the circle. They don't want to stop dancing. If you're a chacham lead, if you're a wise-hearted individual, and you have a cheshit, you have a desire to do the rutzen of Hashem, to do our Kodesh Baruch Hu's will. Even though you have no idea how I'm going to get there, how I'm going to accomplish, how I'll do it. But I trust that you are Kodesh Baruch I'll be able to. Our Kodesh Baruch will give you as a matana. He will give you as a gift 
He will give you a precious present. And he'll say, I'll take care of you. You just keep doing what you're doing. I'll work out all the details that are there. In Mishle Shlomo Melech King Solomon writes, Chacham Leib, Yikach Mitzvahs, a wise-hearted individual, he's Yikach, he takes Mitzvahs, the Evil, however, a foolish person, Sefasayim Yilobet, his lips will cause him to stumble. So a wise-hearted person grabs Mitzvahs, and a foolish person, his lips will cause him to stumble. Rashi says on this, it's referring to an event that took place when there was Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, when the Jewish people were leaving Egypt. And it says, Moshe Rabbeinu is the wise man that the verse is referring to. Shekol Yisrael Yos Oiskin Bebizas Mitzrayim. When they got to the splitting of the sea, and we know the Mitzim all drowned in there and they were spit up onto the dry land. And they had lots and lots of gold and silver and gems and pearls and all the diamonds, everything they had. And it's all, it's all washing up onto the land. So what were the Jewish people doing? They were promised, when you leave Mitzrayim, you're going to leave with a lot of money. So they were going around. You know, they got their metal detectors over there. They're gathering all the metal they possibly can, all the gold and silver. However, who are you? Are you sick from Mitzrayim? Moshe Benu didn't care about the money. He was busy, involved in mitzvahs. Shenema, like it says in the Pasik, by Yikach Moshe's Atzmois Yosef, there was a promise that Klal Yisrael made to Yosef at Sadiq. And the promise was that when we will leave Mitzrayim, we're going to take the bones of Yosef together with us and we're going to bury him in Mitzrayim and end up being in Shechem. Moshe Benu was more concerned. There's billions of dollars of Egyptian money lying on the sea. He said, what's more valuable? A mitzvah or money? Taking the bones of Yosef at Tzadik or taking a few bucks and putting it in my pocket? And so Moshe Rabbeinu is Chacham Leib. He's the wise-hearted individual. He is the one that is taking and grabbing all the mitzvahs while everybody else over here is being quite foolish. Says the Vilna Goyim on this Pasik. And that is, I'm sorry, a person will say, tomorrow I'm going to get up early and I'm going to learn. Not today. Today's not a good day. But tomorrow is going to be a better day. It was raining this morning. It was dreary outside. It was dark. I couldn't sleep all last night because the rain kept pounding on the window right by my head and I kept waking up every few minutes. Today's not a good day for mitzvahs. Tomorrow, though, sure. Tomorrow's going to be a great day. Uh, guess what, says the Vilna Gain. This person will stumble in his commitment, and he will not get up. If you can't do the mitzvahs today, says the Vilna Gain, and you're waiting till tomorrow to perform that mitzvah, guess what, tomorrow you're not going to do it either. That's what it means. A wise-hearted individual will grab mitzvahs. Immediately when they come to your hands, grab it. Because it goes like that. If you don't grab, you know how many people have had their alarm go off in the morning and they know if they know how it works. You got to wake up with the alarm, otherwise snooze and you lose. And the alarm goes off, boom, snooze. Okay, nine minutes later, still nobody's ever answered my, my the mystery question, why is snooze nine minutes? But if somebody comes up with an answer, please let me know. And the nine minutes later, the alarm goes off again, boom, snooze. The next thing you know, it's 8.43 in the morning, you miss Shachris, your first meeting at work is at 9.05, and you now have about 17 minutes to wake up, take a shower, because of course you have to take a shower every morning before you go off to work, pick out your clothing, Davin Shachris, that means putting on tefillin, saying Shema, maybe you'll get the Shema Nesri as well, and still get a good cup of coffee from Starbucks after you have to wait in, in the drive through line for 21 minutes, and still be at the office at 9.05. 
says the Vilna Gai, if you don't grab that mitzvah right now, it's gone. You'll never get it. And therefore, the Eino Mashoi some don't delay. The Evel, who's a foolish person, Avamishu Evel Veino Isetekev, someone who's not so smart. And he doesn't grab the mitzvahs immediately. He says with his lips, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. Tomorrow, maybe. He will stumble, but he won't do it at all. And the other reforms say over here that the problem is, is that the lips, let's see if I can find this, the lips themselves will end up saying a lot, and the person will not accomplish anything with his with his with his actions. Like it says over here that the kachan leiv yikat mitzvahs the evil svasan you love ain't the 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 evil the one who's lived should do but svekos but bisvasav yichitzayim. This person who just keeps saying over words and words and words and words, his words will get him asked him nowhere. Because he doesn't accomplish any of the mitzvahs themselves. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't care about lip service. HaKadosh Baruch Hu cares about service, that we're serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's nice that you talk about all the wonderful mitzvahs that you're going to do, and the great tzaddik that you're going to become, and the amazing wife, and the amazing husband, and the amazing parent. It's all wonderful. All the great plans that we have, it's tremendous. But says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says Shlom HaMelech Nishle. That's not Mamaisa, that's not actual. It's only actual if you grab on and you take hold of the mitzvahs that are there that you do. And a person who allows them to pass out of his hands because he says, I'll do it later, another time, the answer is, you'll never ever do it. Chacham Leiv is someone who says, I cannot delay. There's a mitzvah in front of me right now. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to do it without any delay at all. And that's the same thing that we have in this week's Parsha. Klal Yisrael is standing in the Midbar in the wilderness. And there's hundreds and thousands of details of how to build the Mishkan. You could partially get a headache just from reading all the details that are there. And the Torah goes through it in, with every nuance, with every detail, with every shape, with every form, with everything. And Klal Yisrael sees there's a big mitzvah that's lying in front of them. It's called the building of the Mishkan. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Vasuli Mikdash v'shechanti v'seifnam. You make the Mishkan, I will dwell amongst all of you as a result of it. And the Jewish people don't have a, a time to delay. There's no, well, let's go to construction, construction school and figure out how to do it. No, there is no chance. They are obligated and instructed to do the mitzvahs right now. So they come with chach masalev, with the wisdom that is there in the heart. Their fingers are more obtuse than nimble. Their minds are used to straw and mortar. Their bodies are used to heavy labor. They don't know about any of this fine sculpting and weaving and the like. And yet they know that a chach lev grabs mitzvahs. And even if you don't know how to do it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give you the skill. He'll give you the ability so that you can accomplish the mitzvah that he brings to your hands. The Rav Hirsch writes on this idea the following. It says, the Chol Isha Chachmas Leih Every woman that was wide-hearted, wise-hearted, so the Yadea Tavu with her hands, she would spin, or she spun the wool. And she brought all different types of colors, the blue and the argaman and the purple. The scarlet wool and the, and the other type of a wool. Every woman that was wise-hearted she ended up spinning the, the wool. Then the next verse says, Asher nasa Any woman whose heart had uplifted them, 
then in their wisdom, they were able to spin the goat's hair. So Hirsch is bothered over here. The first wise-hearted women, they're spinning the wool that is there. They're making these beautiful tapestries of all of the colors. The second, when they lifted up their hearts, and they found Chachma, the wisdom inside of them, they spin the goat's hair. So Rav Hirsch points out over here the following idea. And that is that the first set of, of women that were Chachma slave, wise-hearted, they were rushing to go and to start preparing all the fabrics for the beautiful tapestries that you found in the Mishkan. And that's a nice thing. There are beautiful colors tapestries, coverings, all different things. And these women that were wise-hearted, although they had no idea how to do it, they didn't learn it yet, but HaKadosh Baruch infused within them the ability to do it. The second group of ladies over here, he writes, what did they do? They were the ones who chose to do the goat's hair tapestries. These were much less beautiful. They didn't have all the colors. Agamon, Talashani, didn't have the tefillis, didn't have all those colors. It wasn't as beautiful. However, these were the ones that were essential for holding up the Mishkan itself. They were the wraparounds that would hold the Mishkan in place, and therefore they were more essential than the beautiful colors that were there. Points out of Hurst the following, that these were the things that were holding the Mishkan together, which is the essence of the oil of the tent that they were creating, it's going to be a structure in which the Shechina and Klal Yisrael is going to dwell together. What is the job of a woman in this world? The job of a woman is to create the structure, the Oyal, the dwelling place, called the bias, called the house, that she and her husband and her family and anyone that comes in, they will be impressed by the spiritual edifice that this woman has created. So therefore, the women that were more wise-hearted than the Siyas Halei, that they lifted up their hearts to do what was right in the eyes of Hashem, they even accomplished more in the work that they did. If a person wants to be a Chacham a wise-hearted individual, and a person wants to be able to accomplish things that when they set out to do it, they're not quite sure. How in the world am I going to accomplish this? How will I do something? How will I be able to ever daven with Kavana? Good question. How will I ever be able to daven Ishmael Yesrei with Kavana with real intention? I don't know the meaning of the words. I don't understand the way that Ishmael Yesrei works. I don't even know why I'm davening. But I was told when you become religious, you have to daven. I have no idea what am I doing here every single day. But if you have, if you have a wise heart and you want to learn how to do something, you want to achieve things in our latest Hashem, in the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that you never achieved before because you don't know how to do it. But it's out there. Somebody knows how to do it. There's thousands of Jews for generations that have been doing it. That means the ability to accomplish is there. Says HaKadosh Baruch when I see how badly you want to do and to accomplish, I'll give you a matana, I'll give you a gift. You'll have a davening one day, suddenly your mind will open up and you'll look at the words and the words will be jumping off the page. You'll begin to understand what it means. You want Shabbos to be something that is beautiful, elevating, inspiring. You heard all these stories about Yid and how they used to keep Shabbos and it was the holiest of all days. And you know what your Shabbos is like? Kiddush, Chala, L'chaim, Samit, go to sleep. Wake up in the morning, late, of course. Run to shul, late, of course. Daven, da -da 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 -da, with not so much great feeling. Kiddush, L'chaim, go home eat a little bit to make your wife not feel so bad, and go to sleep. Wake up, hopefully, in time for mincha, come back from mincha, and stand, sit, sit there, all of Shalashudas, looking at your watch, wondering when this Shabbos is going to be over. 
That's obviously not what Shabbos is supposed to look like. Shabbos is the greatest day of the week. We know that when Moshe Rabbeinu saw the, he saw Yarvis and Loisam, he saw the suffering that Klal Yisrael was going through. He told Paro, how could you let a, a person, a slave, work seven days a week? They need a break. Paro said, you're right. So give him a break. And he took off Shabbos because if a Jew doesn't have Shabbos, they can't live. So what's my Shabbos supposed to look like? Maybe you have to pick up a book. Maybe you have to learn a little bit. Maybe you have to ask somebody whose Shabbos table you admire and you look up to. How does your Shabbos table look like that? What could I do? If you have chachmas wisdom in the heart, HaKadosh Baruch will give you the abilities to be able to get to the place that you want to be. And perhaps maybe this is the, the answer to the question that we asked in the very beginning also, that if the Torah Kedosh never wastes a single drop of ink, why does the Torah repeat the Parsha all over again in the building of the Mishkan? You already told us all the details, Hashem, in Parsha's Shuma. You went through everything. Rashi ex explained. No, most people don't really like Parsha's Shuma so much because Rashi is so long over there and difficult to understand. I shouldn't say it in that way. Everybody loves Parsha's Shuma. It's just that when you're doing Shnai Mikro and you have to learn Rashi, it's very difficult. So why then come back to Parsha the Yaakov and say the whole thing all over again? Maybe that's the message. Look how impossible it was for Klal Yisrael to build a Mishkan when they had no previous experience or knowledge or any tutelage or any craftsmanship in these areas. And nevertheless, they came with the Chachmas Halev, with the wise-heartedness, they came with the bitachin, with the trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that they will be able to build if they, if they are supposed to and they want to. And they mastered the building of the most difficult structure in the history of the world, where beyond all the physicality, they had to create something that was going to bring the Shekhinah down from here, down to the world over here. And so the Torah says, watch, look how much they did. Look what they did. Again, again, I'm going to tell you again, says the Torah, that you should know how medatic, how specific, and how careful and how perfect Klal Yisrael was with the building of the Mishkan. So I want to leave you all with a story that speaks about this idea of what a person could accomplish if they just want to accomplish. One of the great Bali Musa, one of the great Rosh Yeshivas of the previous generations, was the altar of Slabodka Rav Nasensi Fingal Zekets Adi Bracha. And one of his closest Talmidim students in the Yeshiva was a young boy by the name of Meir Chadash. But Meir Chadash came from a small town called Parish or Parisher. And he was a young Ilu, a genius, and his parents sent him at a young age off to Slabakan when he was like 13 years old, he came to the yeshiva and he jumped in with the lions of the, of the Jewish people and he was holding with the boys that were much older than him. He loved the altar of Slabakan and the altar of Slabakan loved him. They were like almost inseparable. Wherever the altar was, you looked not far behind, you would find, you would find Reneir Chanach. One day, the altar of had to go take a trip for some personal matters, he said, to Berlin. And he told his young prodigy, he told him, listen, Mayor, I'm going myself. Don't come with me. Hey, you stay in yeshiva. You learn. I need to travel on myself. I know how much you want to come with me, but I'm not inviting you. You're staying here. Okay. The Rebbe said, the Rebbe said. Rebbe the altar ends up traveling off to Berlin. One day goes by, two days, three days go by. The Meir Chadash cannot live without the presence of his Rebbe. He says, I know the Rebbe said not to go, but how could I not go? So he goes to the train station on a whim, and he takes a train to Berlin. And when he gets to Berlin, he was a young, really quite a young boy. He's in the major, major city of Berlin. He has no idea what's going on. Where's the Jewish community? Where would his Rosh Hashim be? He doesn't have no idea. He finds a yid walking through the streets. And he says, excuse me, excuse me. Have you seen my Rosh Hashim? Have you seen him here? He says, no, I have no idea. 
He says, but look, you're looking for a Jew? He said, yes. He said, look, there's a Jewish corner with a hotel over there. Go to that hotel. That's usually where all the Jews that are passing through town, that's where they end up staying. So Meir Chadash finds his way to this hotel. He goes to the front desk and he asks, is the altar of Slabodka of Nassim Sifigl here? And they said, yes. As a matter of fact, he checked in two days ago. Fantastic. Meir Chadash begins snooping around the, the hotel. He's looking for his Rebbe and he sees a dining room. And in the dining room, he looks and he sees the altar of Slabodka sitting there. And there's, he's talking to a man in a wheelchair. And the older of Sabanka is telling over in a very animated way, he's talking to this man. And the man is like riveted to everything that the altar is saying, hanging on every single word. And every once in a while, the man just nods his head like this. So Meir Chadash is watching the scene and he slips behind a certain area in the dining room trying to hide himself from his Rebbe. If he gets caught, he's in big trouble. The Rebbe told him not to come. However, the altar was too smart for Meir Chadash, and out of the corner of his eye, he saw him standing there. And at a certain point, when he could not, he, when he could not hide himself, the altar called him over and he said, what are you doing here? I told you not to come. I told you to stay in yeshiva. What are you doing here? And he gave him a tongue lashing that he would never forget. So May felt horrible. And the altar told him, the next time that I tell you something, you listen to what I tell you. Okay. He withstood the rebuke of his Rebbe. But he had to know. He traveled all the way from Slobodka to Berlin. It's a big trip. Every minute of the altar of Slobodka's life was precious. And he finds himself in a little hotel in a dining room talking to a man in a wheelchair who's just nodding his head every once in a while. So he said, Rebbe, what's this meeting all about? So the altar looks at him and he says, I'm speaking to this fellow over here because he wants to open up a koilo. So Melech says, whoa, he's a gvir, he's a wealthy man. He has a lot of money and he wants to, he wants to help you build a koilo. And he said, no, as a matter of fact, the man is tenuous. Oh, but so he said, must be a very influential, powerful person. And if he wants to build a koilo, he can help push it through with his, with the protection that he has with maybe people in the government or the Jewish community or something like that. And the author said, no. Actually, this man lives all by himself. He doesn't really know anybody. And tragically, on top of all of that, he's mute, which means he can't even say a single word. So in reality, said the author, he really can't have influence on anyone. So by now, Abayi Chodesh doesn't understand. The author of Sabaka travels from Sabaka to Berlin. He's spending his time with a man in a wheelchair who wants to build a koilel, who doesn't have a penny to his name, who has no influence on anybody, who's a mute, even if he wanted to try to influence, he can't even talk. So he said, uh, uh, well, what's going on over here? So the altar looked very deeply into the eyes of a man, Chodosh, and he said, I would tell you, my dear Talmud, and this is a lesson that you must never, ever forget. And he said, it's true, this man has nothing. He doesn't have family, he doesn't have money, he doesn't even have the ability to talk and to walk. But he does have one thing. He has Ratzon, he has the will to succeed. And he expressed a desire to open a kolel. So who am I to crush the Ratzon, to crush the will and the desire of another year? If a person has a desire to do something, even though they have no idea in the world where it's going to come from, how they're going to accomplish, how they're going to do, but you come with the chachmas alev, the wisdom that's there inside of your heart, HaKadosh Baruch says, you came to me 
you believe and you trust that I'm going to help you? It says the Nitziv, I'll give it to you as a matana, as a gift. I'm sure that we all have things in our life as a Jew that we would like to accomplish. We have places that we would like to transcend as a Jew that we would like to reach. We have mitzvahs that we would like to work on. We have avayers that we would like to conquer. We have midas that we would like to fix. I'm sure that we all have those things, probably hundreds of them, if we would put our minds to it. And every day and every week and every month and every year we keep saying, I'll get there, I'll get there, I'll get there, I'll get there, I'll get there. I'll get there. And we never get there. And we'll be lying on the deathbed at 95, 100, 120 years old. And I say, okay, maybe tomorrow. Well, there is no tomorrow. Says the Vilna Goyin, says the Nitziv, says Shlomo Melech, Yikach Mitzvah, grab the opportunities now. Because tomorrow's going to be too late. If you have something you want to accomplish, put your mind to it, put your heart to it, put your soul to it. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to help you to accomplish. And in that Sechus, in Yetz Hashem, you will all see, we will all see that we have so much more that we could accomplish, so much more that we will accomplish. And in that Sechus, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. The last major Yetzirah, the last major Geula was Yetzirah Mitzrayim. Hashem took us out of there. Hashem is waiting and waiting and waiting for the Gula to come now. Perhaps all that he's waiting to see is that there's more of us that have a ratzim, that have a desire that Hashem should bring the ultimate Gula with the coming of Mashiach Zikainu in Heira Ve'amin.